Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Leonie Friedrich, and I'm very happy to welcome you on behalf of the Fundación Alternativas here in Madrid to our today's webinar, Zeitenwende and the German Franco Relations. On the occasion of the 60th anniversary of the Elysee Treaty and also the bilateral summit that just took place in January, we um, want to take a closer look at the German Franco relations. Together, they're often referred to as the motor of the EU. So we want to have a look, um, where do they agree and what are the biggest points of contention? Um, and in order to analyze this, we have invited two experts, uh, two guests who are experts in that field. So please let me introduce you to Eric André Matin, who is the Secretary General of the Study Committee on Franco-German Relations at Institut Français des Relations Internationales, the French Institute of International Relations, as well as Kenny Kremer, who is the Program Assistant in the France Program at the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Außenpolitik, the uh, German Council on Foreign Relations. Welcome the two of you and uh, thanks for joining. Hello. Um, after our discussion, also Vicente Palacio, who is the um, Foreign Policy Director at Fundación Alternativas, will give some uh, concluding remarks. So before analyzing the German-Franco relations, we want to also have a closer look at the, uh, the uh, Germany's uh, domestic policy. So within the new coalition, uh, opinions differ greatly. And topics such as the war in Ukraine, energy transition, climate change, um, etc., are dominant issues. So, a question for you, Kenny: um, How do you think do these dynamics within the coalition affect the foreign policy, and hence also its relation with France? Um, I think they have quite an quite an important um, quite an important impact on um, Germany's foreign policy and also on the Franco-German um, relation. I guess one of the most striking examples in the past weeks were actually the the debate was the debate about the tank deliveries to Ukraine, where we could see um, yes some kind of a clear divide between political parties, which are parts of the coalition, but also within the political parties with different branches of them. So there were very very yeah even some heated debates about um, about this question, and also I guess some kind of like um, leadership. Um, contest or question between the foreign office um, led by uh, the foreign minister Annalena Baerbock and the German chancellor Olaf Scholz about how, yeah, the question who is who is actually leading and taking the, uh, the initiative. Um, and I guess when we have a look at the Franco-German relation, we can also see that um, from, from my interpretation, several French leaders understand these dynamics quite well when we have a look at the French um, minister for economy and finance who invites uh, his green counterparts, so Emmanuel Macron, um, who received them at the Elysee, they can actually see the differences between the between the between the three parties in the coalition. So this creates some very um, interesting dynamics in the Franco-German relations. Hmm. And um, evidently, the German-Franco relations have changed since Olaf Scholz is um, has been in office. Um, I think more concretely, one can also say that they actually have cool down quite a bit. Um, Eric André, um, what do you think, how does France perceive this change? I think this is a, a little bit a, a paradoxical situation because uh, before, the, just after the election, uh, this new coalition uh, was considered as, a, as an opportunity for France to uh, relaunch uh, its relationship with uh, with uh, with Germany and to deepen its relationship on on some important aspects because this coalition is basically uh, made of parties which are really uh, pro Europeans and were uh, keen to also develop their cooperation with France uh, and it was it it was also considered as a way to a little bit break with uh, some of the difficulties which were. Uh, um, uh, Badly uh, received in Paris uh, with a former government, and um, and uh, the paradox is that the war in Ukraine has uh, changed the situation because it has created, on the one hand, some tensions between the parties, as uh, Kenny uh, mentioned, and also uh, it has blurred the the agenda of the coalition because of the uh, many issues uh, coming uh, at the top of the agenda from. Uh, 
uh, inflation, uh, energy uh, issues, and uh, uh, the, the the necessity to face uh, the security. So it's a, it's a little bit a, a, a kind of a, of paradox and a, a waste opportunity, uh, I would say. Yeah, well, you both already touched a bit on the energy sector, so let's dive a bit more into this field. Um, as an immediate response to the war in Ukraine, um, the West reacted with sanctions on several levels. Um, Germany, for instance, introduced a new energy model, and as it decided to um, cut off uh, gas supplies from uh, Russia, and is hence looking for, for alternatives, for alternative um, gas supplies, and in this context, in particular, the um, gas pipeline projects Barmar and Midcat provoked heated debates um, over the past month. Um, eventually, Barmar was ratified just before the EU summit um, about energy policy. Yet, eventually, Germany was not uh, Germany uh, didn't is not taking part in the project. Um, can you? Um, do you think that Germany can uh, benefit from this project nonetheless? And how um, does this new energy model affect the German-Franco relation? What do you think? Um, I think, well, when we have a look at the Franco-German declaration after the summit on the 22nd of um, January in Paris, they actually um, refer to the to the Barmo or H2 Med um, pipeline and said that Germany that it could uh, could be extended to Germany or they said that the two countries will take the necessary measures to uh, to make this happen. So I guess from that bilateral point of view, this was something that the two countries would agree on. But um, well, in the recent days, um, there has been all these debates about um, whether. Um, hydrogen that is uh, produced with nuclear energy should be labeled as green um, on the European level, where then Germany and, if I understood right, Spain also did not really follow uh, the French demands. So this kind of puts it into questions again, and this also touches on what you said, the, the, the importance of energy in the bilateral relation, because the two countries have very, very different um, energy mixes or energy models, with um, France obviously um, relying more on um, nuclear nuclear energy whereas germany is yeah phasing out of this i mean they they prolonged the the um, um <clears throat> they prolonged the the time where nuclear energy could be used like the last nuclear plants could be used until um until april this year in or in order to react to the to the war but apart from that um there is a there is a very very clear um divide between the two countries when it comes to nuclear energy in germany is yeah, facing is, is, is actually um, trying to invest more and more in um, renewable energies. So I guess there is some kind of like ideological divide between the two countries, because for Germany, it's almost, I would say, yeah, kind of like part of an identity thing that they do not use it. And for France, it's part of their identity that they do use it. And then, of course, when we talk about the, the classification um, system on the um, on the European level, I guess there are also some kind of economic interests behind as well, because um, if then the hydrogen that is made with um, nuclear energy is seen as green, that's some kind of competition for the green hydrogen that Germany wants to do with renewable energies. And I guess uh, the, the trilateral um, relation with, um, with Spain is very important here because I mean, Spain is also seeing um, renewable or green hydrogen as a, as a, as a, as a, as a promising technology for the future. So I think there are, there are very interesting dynamics between the three countries. So I think in order for Germany to, to benefit from the um, Barma thing, um, from the Barma um, pipeline, they, they, a solution has to be found on the European level on what kind of um, hydrogen is seen as green or not. So I guess that's, this question has to be resolved first. In order for Germany and France and Spain to to advance on the on the question of the Barma pipeline. Mm -hmm. Well, as you as you mentioned, um, they have very France and Germany have very different approaches on this matter. Um, Eric Andre, what do you think was Germany's refusal um, the reason why the trio made this rapid um, decision without it? Oh, the, sorry, um, the refusal referring to the the gas price cap. That's Okay. Yes, uh, there are different uh, 
levels of, of, of discussion, I would say. Uh, I will not come back to what uh, Kenny very clearly uh, described on, on this hydrogen classification. I think just an, a remark on this. Uh, the problem also for France is that uh, because of its energy mix and the, and the, and the future of, uh, of, of uh, the production of, a, of a hydrogen with a nuclear energy, it is excluded to become a mere uh, transit country uh, on energy and to be able also to put some added value uh, in this regard. And, and uh, this is a reason why we have this, this problem at this stage. But uh, from a broader perspective, because you mentioned the, the, the price cap on gas, uh, I think the point is that uh, uh, during the uh, European Council, uh, the announcement by uh, Chancellor uh, Scholz to uh, uh, put 200 billion uh, euros uh, in the German for the German households and for Germ German companies to uh, to uh, lessen the effects of the uh, of the energy uh, 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 price increases in Germany, and at the same time wanted to. Uh, uh, refuse the proposals uh, re, uh, go, coming to, uh, 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 to to put a price cap at European level was very badly received in Paris, but I think also in Madrid and in other European capitals because it was considered as a as a very selfish decision. Uh, on the one hand, uh, wanting to preserve its uh, uh, households and companies, uh, which is legitimate. But at the same time, uh, preventing the other Europeans to to take uh, the same measures, be, and also uh, uh, preserving the the the, the 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 price of the of the of the uh, of the gas at uh, at a, at a very high level. And for this reason, it was it was uh, badly received. And also, I would add that it was not really this decision was not really. Uh, uh, discussed beforehand, it, it came as a surprise, uh, and it, it was an, another mo another reason for uh, this uh, very, uh, I would say, uh, frustration and uh, uh, lack of understanding from the side of, of other countries. Uh, and but one reason to explain this uh, is also the fact that I we mentioned it in the in the in your in the to answer your first question, the the fact is that. Uh, Germany uh, uh, and the Chancellor, the, the, the political uh, decision makers, are under uh, very much, uh, very great pressure from the side of the, of the industry, because there is a very important debate in Germany uh, on uh, relocations, the lack of competitiveness of the of the German industrial sides, and the necessity to find solutions. So. Uh, the, the 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 truth is in between all these elements, and uh, the first impact or the first uh, I would say uh, uh, reaction of the of the uh, European uh, decision makers, the others in France and, and Spain in particular, was tough because of this lack of understanding and this uh, I would say uh, this uh, what was considered as a selfish uh, decision. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Macron, I mean, he also uh, had warned Germany before that uh, takes the risk of, of isolating itself if it uh, yeah, makes this, this uh, own kind of decisions, uh, selfish de decision on its own. Mm -hmm. um, let's continue with the defense sector, which is closely linked to, to the energy sector. It kind of goes hand in hand. Um, in his Zeitenwende speech, just shortly after the outbreak of the war, Olaf Scholz introduced uh, Germany's radical reorientation of foreign policy objectives. You already touched upon it. Um, the war threatens the entire um, post-war order, and this is why a reset is needed. Um, in this context, I think it's indispensable to mention the future combat air system, FCAS, um, which was initiated by uh, Germany and France and where Spain is now also taking place. So this is where we're coming back to this trilateral um, uh, relation. And as well as the European Sky uh, Initiative, the ESSI, um, which was just signed in October, 2022. So just now. Um, 
a question for both of you. Um, how visible, how successful do you think has Germany's U-turn um, in defense policy been so far? And why do you think um, struggle Germany in France so much to find a, a common ground, a common approach on this? Kenny, do you want to start? If I may, okay, yes. So um, on the on the on the question of how successful has Germany's U-turn or Zeitenwende been, I think first of all, um, because you mentioned the the, the speech that Olaf Scholz um, delivered uh, in front of Parliament just a few days after the the, the aggression um, of Russia against Ukraine started. Um, I think on this on the symbolic level, this was all very important. We talk about 100 billion euros for a multi-annual special fund for the armed forces. Um, Germany had to amend its constitution for this. So on a let's say on a symbolic level, there was this speech. We have that very important amount of money, and we changed our constitution to make it happen. So these are very important symbols which show that Germany, yeah, Germany has has reacted to um, to the new context. But um, when we have when we look at the implementation, I would say that well, Germany doesn't really live up to the, the to these ambitions that uh, that it mentioned because apart from that multi-annual special fund for the uh, for the armed forces, the 100 billion, um, we also obviously have the the regular annual defense budget that is voted every year, and there we see uh, it's actually going down from 2022 to 2023. There is a decrease in 400 million euros. I mean, on more than more than 50 billion euros, it's not that much, but still, it's an important political signal. And um, even if you add, let's say, the 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 money that is going to be spent from the special fund and the annual defense budget, we will still we be, we will still be below the two percent target of NATO. Although Germany kind of like made this promise that we wanted to reach it quite fast without giving a clear clear deadline, but still, in the current context, I don't think that it's a very wise or um, adequate decision to um, to kind of like um, postpone this. Um, also, like another example would be the very concrete support to Ukraine. Germany for first uh, said that they would deliver 5,000 helmets and said that this would be an important sign. I mean, other countries kind of like understood it in a different way, which is also quite comprehensible. So. Um, so we see that Germany has been hesitating for a very long time, and also <clears throat> when we talked about when we talk about more, um, let's say, more sophisticated uh, weapon deliveries like light tanks or main battle tanks, um, and there the European perspective comes back again. Um, Germany has been waiting for has waited for the United States actually to take the initiative because when we when France announced that they would send the Leclerc, so the main battle tank Leclerc, uh, um, uh, no, sorry, it was the United Kingdom, sorry, Challenger, Challenger two tanks. Um, Germany still waited for the um, for the Americans to to make an announcement about the Abrams tanks, and when we talk about the light tanks, there the French come in and they announced it in Germany, then still waited for the Americans to do something. So <clears throat> we could actually see that um, Germany is very hesitant, is in a very hesitant position, and that the transatlantic, the transatlantic um, reflexes in its foreign policy come through again. Which then, when we talk about the European Sky Shield Initiative, where Germany is relying more on U.S. and um, Israeli technology, um, yeah, creates uh, creates um, creates some kind of frustration in Paris. But then. I mean, I guess we can we can still come back to that uh, later. We also have to differentiate between, for example, the F-32, uh, 35 jets, sorry, that are going to be bought and the Sky Shield initiative because they have the impression that they are perceived in a different way in, in Paris. But um, I'm sure that Eric, uh, Eric André has more, also more details on that. Eric, do you want to uh, respond to that? Yes. I will continue uh, what Kenny has already uh, uh, sketched. I think the, the point is that uh, first we we perf seen from Paris, I would say. First, we perfectly understand the fact that for Germany it's very difficult to revise its all some very uh, central elements of its foreign policy uh, so quickly. So, for example, the the doctrine that. Uh, Germany does not provide uh, weapons to a country at war. 
and uh, and it's all, all the more difficult that this uh, Ukraine uh, is at war with with Russia. So there are a lot of different uh, historical background issues which are. Uh, 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 very important in Germany and uh, is very sensitive in the public debate. So we are perfectly understand this. But the point is that uh, uh, there is a, a very uh, important underinvestment in the uh, in the defense by Germany for uh, twenty five years or so. And um, and when we uh, in France very much insisted on the necessity to also. Uh, launch uh, programs to uh, also preserve an industrial base in Europe for future for the defense. It was a very difficult discussion with, with the Germans and um, the future combat air system that we discussed uh, is one example of this, the very uh, the, the, the difficulty to launch this, uh, this uh, system. Um, and the difficulty to find agreements on the financing and also on the, I would say, on the schedule. So uh, for this reason, it was uh, seen with a, a, some kind of frustration in France. And as Kenny mentioned, at the same time, with a, a lack of understanding, when we saw that uh, the de decision could be taken very rapidly, uh, when uh, regarding the uh, the question of buying uh, F 35s or the question of developing uh, 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 the Sky, Sh Sky Shield initiative. Also, at a, at a time when we, uh, through also a cooperation with Italy, we could provide some elements of this, uh, of this uh, uh, weapon system, I mean the Sky Shield initiative, because we have with Italy developed uh, some uh, missiles which could uh, be part of this, of this system. So uh, this is the reason why uh, this uh, discussion was a little bit rough uh, or, or, or plagued with some kind of lack of, understand, of, of, of understanding on, on the eve of the, of the 60th anniversary, because uh, it was difficult to see that at, uh, on the one hand, some, some decisions were very rapid, and on the other hand, uh, some others where we were part of, and you also in Spain were part of, uh, were very difficult to take. So uh, this is a little bit the situation. And, uh, but I would say to, to put the emphasis on common issues, the, the issue for us here, uh, the three countries and, and the other European countries is to try to preserve uh, an industrial base on defense uh, because if we do not develop uh, a, a, an aircraft system, uh, we would lose uh, key competencies and we would no longer be in a position in the future to develop any kind of, uh, of system. Uh, uh, so it would, be, uh, it would be a real damage. So this is also what is at stake when we talk about sovereignty. Uh, we have also and uh, also the capacity to act on it autonomously. We have to take these these uh, considerations into into account. So sorry, do I uh, understand you correctly? Then also then that this uh, underinvestment during the past twenty five years, I think you said, and this slow progress when it comes to procurement. Has been or has been a reason why they why France and Germany have such troubles to to find a, a common ground. Yes, it's part of the problem, but uh, also, uh, but Kenny could uh, answer this question better than I, I I could. One element also is the fact that uh, uh, for, uh, it's very difficult for uh, for the the armed forces and uh, for the Ministry of Defense in Germany to uh, translate this decision to create a special fund into uh, uh, contracts for the industry. It will take some time. And, and uh, for this reason, there is, there is a kind of also of, of frustration from the side of the German uh, armed forces and the German industry, because it takes very, uh, it takes a, a long time to be translated into uh, uh, orders, decisions and, 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 and contracts. And from our, from our point of view, we were a little bit uh, um, collateral victims of this uh, of this system because uh, uh, these programs and I mentioned the future combat air system, which was launched in uh, 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 2017, 
did not uh, take off, uh, so, to, so to say. Yeah. Um, I don't know, can you want to, to react on this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would I would agree with um, Eric Andre. So um, I guess because yeah, there is this 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 huge amount of money, 100 billion. Even though, for example, we have the parliamentary commissioner for the armed forces in the German Bundestag who says that it is not enough, and other important um, officials from the German armed forces that even ask for more. But as Eric, Eric Andre already said, it's not only just about the money; it's also about the bureaucratic procurement decisions, etc. So we have this amount of money now, but we also have it, it takes a lot of time to spend it although now we need to adapt in a situation where, where yeah we have to adapt very fast it's, uh, it's very urgent so there is that kind of um, contradiction between on the one hand germany wanting to react very fast to this changing environment and then saying that they would that they would prefer um, mostly American American systems over European ones, saying that they can buy them off the shelf because they are available and ready and they can buy them fast. Whereas certain European systems um, still need to be uh, need to be um, developed. Um, but um, so I think it would be actually important for Germany to kind of like explain this to France and say, for example, when they talked about, when Germany announced that they would buy F-35 jets in order to replace the tornadoes, um, which is also part of these nuclear sharing agreements with NATO. So Germany has to kind of like coordinate with the United States in that, in that field. Um, so I guess that from a French perspective could be understandable that Germany needs to buy these, uh, these new aircraft now because the Tornado ones are very old and outdated and Germany has to, has to modernize this fleet very fast. So I guess if Germany communicated this in a more direct and understandable way, there would be more understanding for this in Paris as well. But I guess then the Sky Shield initiative is different because there, as Eric Andre said, we have a French Italian system that could be included according to, uh, according to different voices also in the French uh, Ministry of the Armed Forces. So I guess when you take these decisions and explain that you need to adapt to a situation um, very fast, I guess that's understandable, but you should not, or Germany should not, um, um, should always keep in mind that uh, the, the industrial base in Europe uh, needs to be preserved in a certain way and make these political commitments on the long run to, um, to, also, to also include European systems. Because when Germany announced the F-35 um, procurement decision, um, I mean, in Paris, uh, I'm, I'm sure that some were wondering what that means for the, for the FCA system and also in, in Spain probably because um, because Germany actually needs to make a long-term commitment, a very, very strong long-term commitment that this decision, which is taking on, let's say, short term in order to react to a, to a situation that is, that is very, very urgent, does not impede on long-term uh, decisions that should favor um, European strategic uh, autonomy. But then on the other hand, we also have to say that uh, the F-35 uh, debate has been going on in Germany for years, um, even already in 2018, 2019, and I guess even before. So Germany could have taken the decision before all this happened. So now Germany is kind of facing um, facing the consequences of this. We didn't, we weren't ready to, to find a compromise or to take a decision um, on the fighter jet question. And now there are all these different crises happening at the same time. There was war in Ukraine. We, we are developing this uh, air defense sky shield system. We have to replace the tornado uh, jets. So if Germany had taken some initiatives in the past, we wouldn't have these problems today. So there is also a question of, of timing here. Well, thank you. Um, I want to, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> May I add uh, one, an, an, another point? Uh, because uh, Kenny pointed out the, the war in Ukraine and we have to say a word also on this because uh, these programs uh, were started or uh, were, we were talking about, about these programs before the, this, this war. But I would like to add another dimension uh, created by this war uh, or after this war. The point is that we, uh, with the war in Ukraine, we see that we are entering a, a new phase uh, characterized by uh, what the military called uh, high intensity conflicts. And we have also to consider that these conflicts uh, require uh, uh, 
an, a, a mass of troops and equipment that we have lost after the the, the, the end of the Cold War, and uh, it require these conflicts require also uh, ammunition, a great quantity, and, and, and a lot of, uh, of 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 equipment, which are uh, 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 that which can get in in Europe at at very uh, slow pace. And uh, for this reason, we have also to consider together in Europe that we have to adjust or to adapt to this new situation and that we have also to intensify our discussion in order to be able to uh, provide uh, basic things such as ammunition uh, uh, in sufficient quantity and uh, et cetera. So we have also to rethink the way we uh, have uh, planned and uh, prepared for uh, for conflicts um, in the in the future, and I stop here my my remark. <laughs> um, yeah, you also already mentioned the the FCAS. Uh, um, I would like to come back to this. What do you think, um, Eric Andre? Uh, how does this influence this, or what kind of impact has this on this triangular relationship? Since Spain is also taking part in this initiative. Uh, Spain is also part of Airbus, uh, so uh, I think we have already cooperation with Spain. So the fact that Spain is part of the program is not a problem in itself. It's a, it's a, a rather a good thing to have, uh, I would say, a, a broader uh, partnership. The problem is more uh, uh, a difficulty to find agreements between uh, industrials, between the companies, because uh, from the beginning, and it was also part of the, it was recalled in the in the, the uh, statement of the Franco-German Defense Council, um, the, 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 div the division of labor initially was that France would take the lead as regards the, the but aircraft and that Germany would take the lead as regard uh, the the main battle the future main battle tank and uh, the problem was that uh, for different reasons uh, also the different the, the, the differences in the structures etc um, we had a, a lack of a I would say of political guidance. I would I would put it this way, uh, in the conduct of the program. So the, uh, when you you leave the industrialists uh, between themselves, uh, it's difficult to get an agreement because everybody will find will fight for its interest, etc. And uh, if you, uh, as long as you don't, uh, as long as you have some uh, a, a political authority who comes and say yes, it will be this way. And uh, because I am the one who pays in the end, and um, and uh, we will we will find the agreement on this basis. And it it was it was part of the it was I would say one of the main reasons for having this uh, difficulty to agree, uh, lack of political co commitment. And it was not absolutely not uh, due to uh, the fact that we uh, are uh, three on board. Uh, and I think uh, in the end we will have also to. Uh, um, to uh, find the markets for this uh, aircraft, and I think if Spain is part of the uh, uh, of, of 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 this market, it, it it would be good. And other Euro European countries. So I think the problem was more a lack of uh, of political guidance and the, the uh, also the inherent difficulty. Uh, of this kind of program, which are very much forward-looking uh, and uh, trying to uh, develop a lot of um, of new technologies, a lot of uh, technological ambition, and for this reason, it's also a very uh, there are a high uh, a lot of issues uh, at stake, and it's uh, intrinsically difficult to, to uh, come to an agreement. Mm -hmm. Well, as far as I know, at least that's what I what I read was that it was the the desire of both uh, Germany and France to collaborate. But then the problem was, among others, that France was not very, how to put it, very willing to to share technical knowledge. Um, so, uh, well, anyways, now the situation seems a bit uh, more uh, more positive, and the prototype, as far as I know, is supposed to be ready in two thousand twenty eight. So um, yeah, let's see how this is gonna gonna go. Um, I would also like to come back to the ESSI that we already touched upon. Um, can you do you think that Germany has the power to convince France, or do you think it would make sense to convince France 
to uh, convince France of the benefits of the project so that it would eventually take part in it. Of course, for now, it has its own project with Italy. Um, I think a lot of damage has been done actually when this was announced. So France really, and I think this is something that has already been mentioned in the energy, um, in the field of energy, when Germany announced the 200 billion um, aid for households and companies, France felt that they that there was not enough coordination. I guess, well, I'm quite sure that on the SkySheet initiative, there was some more coordination than in the field of the um, of energy. But um, still, the reactions were actually quite uh, quite negative in France. So I think if Germany wants to convince France to join it, it really need, has to make an, an effort in a certain way. Um, so I guess when we talk about the benefits, first of all, I think we need we have to we have to ask ourselves also what kind of benefits it should have. Is it just like um, like a common procurement thing in order to like maybe save some money or do we really want an integrated air defense system with information sharing etc so i think on that from that point of view germany still kind of needs to define the goals and objectives behind so if we if then for example the objective or one of the um, one of the advantages of uh, the sky shield initiative uh, uh, if this should be, um, for example, a more integrated, um, interoperable um, system with information sharing between the countries, etc., this would probably already be more um, more attractive for France. And then, as we already mentioned, um, Germany should, wherever possible, also try to include um, the the French systems and most importantly the French Italian SAMP uh, T system. Well, I guess then you could always find technical technical arguments and issues, but uh, it's always a mix between political considerations and technical considerations. So I guess these would be like the the two main efforts Germany would have to make in order to in order to convince France. So first of all, define very um, let's say ambitious objectives when it comes to a truly integrated European air defense system. And secondly, um, also take into consideration the procurement of um, French or more European, uh, more, more European material. But I'm not quite sure that uh, after all the all, all what happened, that France would still be willing to to join that that uh, that initiative. Eric Andre, what's your take on this? Do you think uh, France is still or would consider uh, joining this initiative? I would share the, the view of Kenny on this. Uh, I think we, we should ask the, the French Ministry of Defense, but uh, the point is that uh, a, a lot of, I would, I would take two points. The first, a lot of damage have been, has been done in, the, in a context which was all, already tense for we, uh, or uh, uh, broiled with other issues. And it was unnecessary to put this uh, on top of the, uh, 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 the, the weight was done on top of it. Uh, but I think we have to look uh, for the for the future because what is at stake in the context of the of the, of the war in Ukraine is the capacity for Europeans to uh, to to stand up and to be able to uh, deliver uh, first uh, uh, an aid to to Ukraine, uh, support to Ukraine, but also to. Uh, uh, develop their own capacities uh, to match with uh, the reality of uh, of the threat today, and I think uh, uh, the point is that we should take some lessons from what has been done uh, and to be able to, to go forward. And I, I mentioned uh, before a few examples, of, because it's it's not already it's not only a question of having very sophisticated and very. Uh, uh, unique uh, weapon system. It's also a, 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 a basic issue of logistics, being able to provide enough ammunition for a, a prolonged country, a prolonged conflict, sorry, and to be able to have also the, the capacity to uh, move your troops uh, uh, on the on the on the on the, uh, on the continent. And uh, beyond these uh, hardware issues. Uh, there is there is also an issue of uh, troops and and the capacity of having uh, interoperable troops, and uh, I've seen in the, the statement of the uh, of the last uh, meeting of the of the French German ministerial councils that um, 
there is a, a project, there is a mention of the uh, Franco-German uh, brigade and the, the uh, intention to deploy this brigade also uh, um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the NATO flanks. So it could be also a sign, a good sign that we are uh, also taking our responsibilities also beyond what has already been done, um, also to to uh, participate in the defense of uh, of the of, uh, alliance members, which are uh, directly exposed uh, on the on, uh, on the front line. I would say. Well, I, think, I don't know if you want to add anything uh, on this, Kenny. Otherwise, I will uh, I will proceed with the bilateral summit. Okay, yeah, just on the on the on the Franco-German brigade on the in the Eastern European NATO countries, I think this could be actually a very promising, um, a very promising initiative because it could reinforce the bilateral cooperation between France, give a new dynamic to the brigade, because it, the the way it has been used was also criticized in in recent years and also send a very important signal to the Eastern European partners who were actually criticizing France and Germany a lot for not being um, uh, ambitious enough in their in their support to Ukraine. So I think I just wanted to yeah underline the uh, the importance of uh, of that initiative. But yes, please go on with the bilateral bilateral summit. Um, yeah, this uh, bilateral summit that just took place uh, in January. Uh, initially, it was planned for October. However, due to severe differences between Germany and France, it was postponed various times. Um, I think one can say that an institutional reform is needed. Um, otherwise, the change is impossible. But um, do you think this reunion was a more a symbolic one? Or do you think we can actually expect some changes now after, after this bilateral summit? Both of you. <laughs> Okay, I'll go. I'll go first then, or Eric. Okay, um, I guess it was more of a more of a symbolic one because, like we mentioned, the the um, the idea of deploying the Franco-German brigade, which is a, an initiative that was mentioned in the in the declaration after the summit. So this is something very concrete, and there have been other concrete examples like a Franco-German youth ticket. Or um, or other things which are very concrete and useful things, but um, the reason why the summit was postponed several times was also because uh, the two governments said that they wanted to find uh, that they wanted to find concrete solutions for the big problems. And I think these actually this, these announcements actually um, put the expectations even higher. And when you compare these expectations with with the outcome. That yeah, that was produced in the end. I don't really see the big initiative now that reinvigorates and redynamizes the Franco-German partnership. So um, apart from these very concrete, from these very concrete initiatives, I think when we have a look at the bigger picture, at the big, at the big, big problems, um, of course, the war in Ukraine, energy transition. Um, but also, we are currently talking about the reform of the European Union um, fiscal rules. So where France and Germany might also enter into conflict, um, when we have a look at all these big questions, I don't really see very concrete, concrete initiatives on these big questions. We see very vague, uh, vague formulations like we will coordinate and cooperate, etc. But we don't. It's very, it's very vague. So I think from the symbolic point of view, it was very important to to make this to make this summit happen. And also when you have a look at the speeches that have been. Uh, delivered by the French representatives like Emmanuel Macron or even the the president of the National Assembly, they were very emotional and very yeah very captivating um, speeches. So you can see the French commitment to that. Um, so I guess from the symbolic point of view, it was important. But I'm still still waiting for um, yeah for the announcements announcements on the on the on the bigger on the bigger questions. But then also maybe I should have been more realistic in a certain way and say that the you can't really solve this in when during just one summit during one day. That's impossible. But um, yeah, 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 on please. <laughs> yes, uh, I would. I am. I, I agree with with Kenny on this. Uh, I think uh, it was necessary to to, to clarify the, the situation. 
to also recommit publicly to the importance of this relation and uh, the symbolic and uh, also the uh, emotional dimension was uh, very important uh, on this regard. You see that uh, the, the main deci political des uh, decision makers in both countries were there and uh, very committed to this, uh, to this uh, relationship and to this uh, historical friendship. So all this was necessary uh, to also bypass or to uh, overcome the uh, difficulties which we uh, described before, which were very much, uh, uh, which were very, uh, I would say, very much uh, uh, noticed in the public debate in both countries by the press, etc. And it is always a sign of, uh, uh, of it is also a, a sign of concern uh, when things go, do not go well between uh, Paris and Berlin. And, uh, and it is not on, only in, in, our, in our countries, in our respective countries, but I have noticed because of my uh, job that it is also uh, very much noticed outside in other European capitals. And, uh, and so for this reason, uh, it was important to, to, to overcome these difficulties. But I agree that we have not a big push forward, uh, which is commensurate uh, to the situation we have uh, uh, to deal with. And uh, we have to be realistic. It will take some time, but uh, we see what can be done uh, also to be able to uh, uh, give a, a, a line, a direction uh, as regards uh, the European project because we are considering here uh, middle and long-term issues uh, which have been uh, impacted by this war in Ukraine. If we take the, the, the question of uh, enlargement, we cannot consider the issue of enlargement the same way it was before the, the war and, and after the war. If we take the issue of uh, uh, reform of institutions, it is the same. And uh, also because of the uh, economic situation, uh, in Europe, uh, partly created by the war in Ukraine, we have to consider the issue of uh, uh, public finances and uh, the, the stabilization uh, uh, and convergence of the of the of, of the of the of the budgets uh, in the in the respective countries. So, for all these re for on all these issues, uh, we have not so much, uh, uh, I would say, deliverables yet. But uh, we have to 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 tackle these issues rapidly, because uh, and to make a link with what we said before, um, Germany has spared also many uh, uh, by not investing much in in its defense system. Uh, when whereas other countries invest in more, so do, do we have to consider that, for example, investment in the defense system could be. Uh, uh, considered differently in the in the in the as regards the the, sta the the rules of the of the of the of the stability pact etc etc uh, and do do we have how do we have to consider investments in new technologies because we are very much uh, talking about green tech uh, do we have to consider these investments as uh, 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 differently or to value these investments as we did before. Mm. Um, I would just like to uh, come back to one point that you mentioned, um, the the fact that this change of the 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 changing situation which, between Paris and Berlin is perceived by other capitals. In this context, it is also often argued lately, or has been argued lately, that uh, Western powers are losing more and more influence. At the same time, Eastern powers are gaining impact. Um, what do you what do you think on about this? What's your take on that? Just briefly on this, I think uh, in the end uh, the point is uh, if Europe is losing ground or not in this in the in this conflict, and in and the point is that uh, uh, the point is not so much West against uh, East. The point is that uh, we could collectively lose. Uh, ground if we do not pay uh, much attention to what is going on and if we uh, don't uh, remain united and this is I think the main the main message and if France and Germany do not get united on these issues everybody will lose in the end 
<laughs> well, thank you very much. I don't know, Kenny, if you have anything to add, otherwise. Yeah, I guess I would I would agree with uh, what Eric Mat Eric Andre uh, just said that France and Germany need to find a common common response to this. I mean, we could still. I mean, I would also see that kind of power shift, but um, yeah, when it comes to um, really um, um, preserving the unity in Europe, we really need uh, need this uh, uh, yeah and reinforced cooperation between the two, and also maybe a more inclusive one because we talked about trilateral with Spain. We could also bring in Italy, Poland, etc. So um, yeah, there is still much to much to be done. Well, thank you very much, uh, the two of you. Before closing our discussion, I would now like to invite Vicente Palacio, who just joined our session, um, to yeah share some some light on this issue from a more uh, Spanish perspective, as we also yeah uh, touched upon the triangular situation. Vicente. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Leonie. Uh, uh, thank you very much to Eric Andre or from E3, and um, Kenny Kramer from the German Council for Relations. It was a very nice this review, very helpful for us. Uh, I saw that there were two Germans on the table and one French, but it was not unbalanced anyway. So uh, let, let me let me join us and say a few words as an Spaniard. Uh, analyst uh, who uh, uh, is uh, concerned with uh, well uh, the European agenda that uh, the Spanish government will pursue will conduct during the, the Spanish presidency of the EU Council in this uh, second semester of this year. Um, it was very interesting uh, all your insights and I repeat very 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 uh, useful. Um, I as far as we see from Spain uh, this. Uh, German Franco Franco German relation is uh, still alive and works uh, as um, uh, obviously uh, due to all kinds of mechanism uh, which are uh, in motion which are at work uh, despite disagreements and rifts uh, it works um, but at the same time we see that as you mentioned there is a recomposition recomposition. Uh, of the German politics, uh, also the French politics, and of course of the European Union in general uh, as, a, as a whole. So in this context of recomposition, uh, Spain would like to see uh, this German-Franco relation uh, uh, be alive and, and keep it warm at times when these uh, relations seems to be cooling uh, our role is also to keep it warm. Why? Because uh, despite the fact that, uh, for instance, President uh, Pedro Sanchez might have gained some leverage on Brussels and the EU uh, scenario because of the lack of the leadership of, uh, of uh, Macron, of the weakness, in a moment of weakness of uh, the French leadership in Europe, of Macron and, and Scholz in Germany, it's not, uh, we, we do recognize that, uh, that the French-German uh, relations uh, motor is a key for further integration, for further integration. So uh, what we want to do is just to join the club, uh, maybe not in equal terms, on equal uh, 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 terms as, as, as the German of the French, but at, at, at least uh, to have our voice, voice heard. And, and contribute to uh, the, uh, this integration process. For, for instance, you mentioned energy. Uh, yes, we are deep uh, uh, intertwined in deeply intertwined in this um, discussion on the model uh, energy model for Europe. So, as you know, uh, the Iberian exception that we made with Portugal, uh, trying to topple the Gas prices linked to uh, the electricity prices linked to 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 the price uh, of gas. Uh, then uh, our current um, proposals for a structural reform of the electricity market. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, this is very important, and this is a huge discussion in in in, in the capitals and in Brussels right now. 
Um, the question of the hyd green uh, hydrogen corridor, uh, the, the Barmar that was uh, finally approved uh, uh, by by uh, the French and the Spaniards, the the the, 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 the Portuguese, and also by by, I mean by by Germany. All these questions are very 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 important. Uh, what kind of Europe we would like to see right now, or what 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 kind of Germany, what kind of France, what kind of um, Europe? Uh, well, we would like to see one where, in terms of defense, for instance, Spain would like to catch or could catch up with those projects, with those big projects. You mentioned the PSIS, uh, their uh, system. As you, as you explained, uh, Eric, uh, we, we are out of that uh, for obvious reasons, but other projects could uh, come uh, soon. Uh, arrive soon, and we would like to be there. Uh, of course, this is goes beyond our uh, of, of Spain's intentions. This is part of the structural uh, fragmentation of the industrial defense market in Europe. So this needs a long term perspective. Uh, we are pretty much interested in, uh, when we look at Germany and France in a common also in a common industrial policy common industrial policy. So we will, we will like to see unilateral uh, actions, initiatives, as we saw in, in the case of, of Germany, which was not consulted with anyone. And we don't think that this is not good for, for, for the, for the uh, um, Europe as uh, in, 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 for the EU in general. Uh, also because we don't have the fiscal capacity that the Germans have. Neither France have that fiscal capacity to invest hundreds of billions of euros in, in subsidizing uh, in tech and in, 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 in business uh, um, right now. So this has to be done in common, uh, in, 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 in common for, for the, at uh, 27 and not, not uh, for, uh, not uh, just uh, as a result of, of, of the uh, ONE's initiative. And one member initiative and the social we would like to see the social uh, uh social europe we would like to uh, reinforce the uh, european semester uh, uh, when it comes to uh, you know uh, the reinforcement of labor conditions the minimum wage uh, this is the l'europe qui protège this is the the the, 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 the adagio of, of, of the, the President Macron. Uh, we, well, we just like to follow this, this, uh, this dictum and, and, and make, it, uh, make Europe more social uh, now and after the presidency. As for the enlargement, uh, you, you didn't, didn't have the time to talk about much about the enlargement, but this is very important for us because of course we, uh, do have this uh, solidarity principle uh, when it comes to the incorporation of the Western Balkans. And of course, we have, as, as a government, Spain has uh, supported in, in Brussels and the capitals the idea of, uh, of, of, of um, appointing uh, Ukraine also, then well, uh, Moldova and, and, and Georgia will come as a, as a, a, a um, a candidate a member to the uh, uh, to the EU, uh, but at the same time uh, we will have like to uh, think very seriously what we got in exchange with this. Uh, we got a lot of things, of course, in 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 in, in economic, in social, in, in institutional uh, uh, terms. This is what the EU is about, but. Uh, this cannot be done uh, at the expense of, you know, uh, the, uh, the Southern Mediterranean, the, the African uh, 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 frontier, and, and we do we will need more resources, more attention, and uh, and more balance uh, Europe in a moment when things are going eastward. Things are going eastward. 
uh, the, the Baltic countries or Poland and many others are gaining uh, leverage, much leverage. Uh, and sometimes uh, we do feel that it might be, it might be, uh, it doesn't have to be like that way, but it might be at the expense of uh, paying attention to our uh, um, um, southern uh, uh, concerns. Uh, and finally, as for the geopolitical standpoint uh, uh, of uh, Europe in general, uh, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned very rapidly the strategic autonomy. I think it was uh, Kenny also who mentioned that. And uh, we did not see in uh, yet in, in the site and the doctrine of uh, Chancellor Schultz, this idea of a strategic autonomy, mm -hmm. uh, which is worrisome because we as Spaniards, we do support this idea but we don't see it in the, uh, uh, the uh, um, ideological and, and, and policy horizon of, of, of the Germans. Um, so maybe this uh, should be clarified in further uh, conversations and, and seminars that we will uh, hold. Uh, it's clear that in this regard, um, the Ukraine war, and this is very important for us, uh, should not uh, mean uh, the, uh, a new or entering a new dependence on other great powers. And in that includes the United States, not only China, but also the, the Americans. And, and we met, you mentioned the industrial policy, all the, 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 the trade war that we could uh, have with the Americans in the case they don't rectify. Uh, this, uh, the, the, uh, the IRA uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, uh, recently uh, uh, put in, in, in motion by, by the Americans. And, and of course, uh, the Ukraine war is uh, also, also is an opportunity. We we'll see, and we agree with you, uh, with Eric and, and Kenny, this is an opportunity to go forward, uh, but uh, as long as we do not uh, forget that uh, there is a risk of uh, uh, becoming more dependent on others, and this is so. This is why the idea of the strategic autonomy is so important uh, for us. And this is basically what uh, all the uh, Leonile, the things that I, I just like to to mention. Thank you, thank you very much, and you will have to finish and uh, conclude the. Uh, Leonie, this uh, this uh, this conversation. Thank you, thank you again, and and and, and we meet uh, soon again. Of course. Well, thank you, lot, thank you, for uh, also including the the Spanish perspective. Uh, Kenny or uh, Eric Andre, I don't know if you want to respond to that. React to this. Um, final. Yeah, I think yeah. Thanks. First of all, thank you, thank you for the for the closing remarks. Um, yeah, I think yeah, the the, the importance of strategic autonomy is really um, something that we cannot underline underline enough. And uh, I would agree in the current German side and then we haven't seen enough of this. So maybe we will see some change in the future. Yes, and thank you, uh, Vincente, uh, for this uh, for these remarks. I would say we have a. Uh, enough substance to uh, organize a, another uh, webinar before the, the Spanish presidency uh, to, to see where we stand. Uh, and, I, and second point, I think it's very important to have also uh, uh, this kind of discussion in, in triangular format uh, because uh, uh, we don't have much time to develop or to uh, explain this, but I think one also of the challenge for the Franco-German relation is not to be uh, perceived as a, as a very exclusive club. I think the point is that we have to also uh, open to discussions with uh, other uh, member states and Spain is one of them. And uh, also because of the, uh, of the fact that you are involved in some of the other uh, cooperation, it is all the more important to have this kind of, uh, of exchange and discussion. And we think tanks are also uh, facilitators in this uh, in this regard 
Well, uh, Eric André, Kenny, I would really want to thank both of you and also Vicente uh, for your time, for shedding some light on this very complex, yeah, not only bilateral, but also trilateral uh, relationship. I think we had a very interesting and insightful debate. And as you said, we already have uh, food for thought for, uh, for the future and for uh, another webinar. Um, yeah, and also thanks to everyone who followed us online. On this note, I would like to end uh, the session and I wish you all the best and take care and thank you. Thank you very much.